Hello, everybody. Are we? Hello, everybody. There we go. That's better. All right. Starting our service up here. Happy Father's Day to everybody that is uh, that is celebrating that today. We're we're thankful for that. Uh, but we're most thankful to be here starting this service today. We've got two people uh, getting baptized today, uh, and we're so we're thankful to celebrate that. We always explain what baptism is, just in case you're you're new with us and you don't know why we're doing this. Baptism is a representation of what Christ has done for us. Christ shed His blood on the cross. He was placed in the in the grave in the tomb. And then he was brought back to new life. And we're symbolizing that we believe that what he did saves us from our sins. It, it forgives us of our sins uh, and it gives us the gift of eternal life. Baptism doesn't do that. What Jesus did does that. And we do this act to celebrate what Jesus has done and what we're saying uh, that we believe. So we've got Jessica, Jessica Skeen getting baptized this morning. We've got Matt Buckley getting baptized this morning. And uh, we're just thankful to celebrate this together. So, Jessica, if you want to come down and be the first victim. She's, she's a little nervous about the process. I told her brother Clayton always said, if you get them down, they'll get themselves up. <laughs> yep. So, Jessica, is it true that you have repented of your sins, placed your faith in Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins and the gift of eternal life? Yes. And I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried in his likeness, and raised to newness of life. That a girl. <laughs> Come on down here, Matt. Yeah, it feels good, man. No, I'd rather have it in the cold. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You can ask somebody about that cold water. It's not any fun. <laughs> when you've already joined the polar bear club, it's okay. Okay. All right, Matt. Is it true that you've uh, repented of your sins, placed your faith in Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins and the gift of eternal life? Yes, I have. Then I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, buried in Jesus' likeness, and raised to newness of life. Woo! <laughs> All right, Truett is going to come up and lead us in our reading today, and then we'll get into, or excuse me, Josh is going to come up and lead us in a song first, and then Truett will come up and lead us uh, in a reading. So I'm going to pray for us as they're coming up, and then uh, we'll continue with our service. We're so glad that you're here. You're right where you're supposed to be today. Father, I thank you, and I love you for your grace and your mercy, God. I thank you for uh, just the invigorating celebration that baptism is, God, that another soul is professing you as Lord and Savior, as King of Kings. God, I just thank you for that today. I thank you that you love us, that you have done what it takes to justify us, God, that you are both just and justifier. I just thank you for that today, God. I thank you that, that you chose us uh, before time began. Uh, Lord, we just want to celebrate you and worship you and praise you and lift your name up today uh, and for all the greatness that you are and that you have done and will do. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship. Amen. Yeah, we invite you to stand and sing with us this morning. Age. 
needs to age the same And he must win the battle And though this world with devils filled Should threaten to undo seated for the reading. Okay, I got our responsive reading this morning. Uh, just, uh, I'll read what's uh, not in yellow. That's really confusing. So please read with me what's in yellow so it won't be really awkward for me. I appreciate it. Christ is the eternal Son of God. In his incarnation as Jesus Christ he was conceived of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. Jesus perfectly revealed and dealt the will of God, taking upon himself human nature with its demands and necessities and identifying himself 
completely with mankind, yet without sin. He honored the divine law by his personal obedience, and in his sacrificial death on the cross, he made provision for a redemption of men from their sins. He raised from the dead with the glorified body and appeared to his disciples as the person who was with them before his crucifixion. He ascended into heaven and is now exalted at the right hand of God, where he is the one mediator, fully God, fully man, in whose person is effected the reconciliation between God and man. He will return in power and glory to judge the world and to consummate his redemptive mission. He now dwells in all believers as the living and ever-present Lord. Thank you. I invite you to stand again, if you would, as we continue to sing. During this time, as we're doing this song, I uh, invite anyone who wants to, who needs to pray, come forward. Um, we've got people here willing and ready to pray with you, um, but just feel free to come. That's, that's what we're here to do, is to worship. And this is a time to worship through prayer.
once was lost in darkest night you thought I knew the way the sin that promised joy and life it led me to the grave I had no hope that you would owe a rebel to If you had not loved me first, I would refuse you still. Hallelujah, all I have is Christ. But as I ran my hell-bound race Indifferent to the cost You looked upon my helpless state And led me to the cross And I beheld God's love display You suffered in my alone and live so all might see the strength to follow your commands could never come from me oh father use my ransom life in any way you choose and let my song Oh, hallelujah.
Heavenly Father, this morning we thank you for. We thank you for new lives brought to you and demonstrated this morning through the act of baptism. Lord, we just ask that you would that you would dwell in this place this morning in our hearts, in our minds, and in our spirits. Lord, awaken us to the things that you have for us this morning. Lord, let us not waste this time thinking about things of this world, but Lord, let us focus our eyes and our minds on you and things of you and your ways. Lord, and let that settle in us, into us that, that that becomes our thoughts, that, that your thoughts are our thoughts and your ways are our ways. That you increase in us and this old human self decreases to where you are the only thing that can be seen. Lord, we thank you for Daniel and his diligence and willingness to study your word and to share with us what you share with him. Lord, be with him as he comes and speaks. Just speak through him, Lord. Lord, we thank you for we thank you for this morning for our fathers, those that that were like fathers to us. All of those that have, have poured into our lives and been great examples of what what a godly man should look like, a man after your own heart. Lord, continue to strengthen those of us that, that live that role, to be the men that you've called us to be, to step up and step in when we need to. Lord, I thank you for our church and just for the willingness to serve that, that, that flows throughout the doors here. Lord, continue to use us. Lord, we thank you for Jesus this morning and it's in his holy name that we pray. Amen. Y'all may be seated. Kids, you're dismissed. Good luck, Darren. Good luck. Thanks, dude. You're all right. All right, we are finishing up. We are finishing up uh, the statements of I am. We have one more week of this series. All right, no groans. That's good. We have one more week of this series. We, this is the seventh statement today. There's two other times where Jesus said I am, but he didn't have anything to go with that in John. We'll finish that up next week. Uh, but the last statement is today. We've been looking at this now. This is our seventh week. I am Jesus, Jesus in his own words. The Gospel of John, chapter 15 is where we'll be today. We've looked at Jesus says, I am the bread of life, the light of the world, the door of the sheep, the good shepherd, the resurrection and the life, and last week, the way, the truth, and the life. If you're a note taker, my notes are at that website or that QR code, same thing, same place. And uh, you can have my notes and email those to yourself. You can take notes along with that if you want to. Just something we try to do to help you. So, I do want to say, Happy Father's Day. Uh, we're not necessarily preaching a Father's Day message today, um, but I do want to say Happy Father's Day. We do have some really cool dads uh, in this church, and uh, I don't know if we have anybody that's Mohawk, Wilson headband, Fu Manchu, and a camel shirt cool. But, but, <laughs> I, I don't know if you're that, I don't know if you're that cool. I don't know if you guys are that cool. Uh, and I don't know if it gets any cooler than that. But it might get a little cooler than that. I mean, you could add short red shorts, long black socks, and untied shoes. <laughs> now that's a cool dad right there. I don't care who you are, that's a cool dad. <laughs> For those of you who don't know, that's true at our student pastor. So <laughs> in case you're wondering why I said the guy was born to be a student, he was born to be a student pastor. There's no doubt about that. So happy Father's Day to all the papas out there. We appreciate you. Let's read these verses and let's dig into this today. 
John 15, starting in verse 1, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vineyard keeper. Every branch in me that does not produce fruit, fruit he removes, and he prunes every branch that produces fruit so that it will produce more fruit. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me, and I in you, just as a branch isn't able to produce fruit by itself unless it remains on the vine, so neither can you unless you remain in me. Verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. The one who remains in me, and I in him, produces much fruit, because you can do nothing without me. Join me in prayer, would you? Father, I come to you today, and I just thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that you would... Give us all a heart that desires to remain in you, God, that we desire to be constantly and consistently in your fellowship, in your word, Lord, that you're living in us and through us with our lives. But I pray that anyone here today or in the building or listening through the camera that doesn't know you, that has never come to know you at all, that today would be the day of salvation for them, God, that they would learn that they are a sinner and they need to repent of that sin because sin has a price. And that price has already been paid by Jesus Christ. You are the justifier and the just judge, God. You have made a way for us to know you forever, to be forgiven of that sin and given the gift of eternal life. And I pray that today that someone that doesn't know you would be, this would be the day that they would come to know you, that they would come to salvation today. For all those that do know you, God, I pray that today we are revived by the truth of your word. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So we're talking about uh, vines. Now, for the most part, we're, this would mean a grapevine. Uh, obviously, fruit uh, and wine were a major part of, of life uh, in, the, in ancient Israel, in, in most of the ancient Mediterranean uh, cultures. So, you know, I, I kind of did a deep dive and tried not to bring too much to the table when it comes to this because you guys know how I can get sometimes. I can expand on stuff like this way past the point of it ma mattering, but... Um, there are some things about ancient uh, viticultural practices that I think help us understand this, which is just vi how to grow vines. Uh, so ancient vine growing, there were a couple of things that took place. Uh, when it grew, it, it, sometimes they just grew it on the ground. Now, growing it on the ground poses problems because it's easier for it to get black rot. It's easier for it to be eaten by uh, bugs and, and things like that. Uh, and so once it started growing, then they would usually raise it up. They would lift it up. Uh, on trellises, uh, or the other way would, they would just start it that way. And that's the way we see it most of the time. You can see in that picture as those vines grow. Most of the time in modern practices, it's just already on a pole. It's already on a trellis. Uh, the vine grows up, and then the fruit clusters come out from the top and grow down and out in all different types of ways. Now, there's two times that they would prune back then, and it's basically the same now as far as that goes. Uh, so you had a spring pruning when you would cut back things in, this, in the spring. That's what pruning means, to cut back some things that are growing. So you would, there's four things. One, you would remove growing tips of vigorous shoots, which is something that would come off the branch, uh, that would get too big, too fast, and couldn't hold the weight of the fruit. Sometimes they would try to grow too fast, and those they had to cut back because they just couldn't handle the weight of the fruit. They would actually, by growing too fast and growing fruit before they were ready, it would actually kill that shoot so they cut it back so that doesn't happen second thing they would cut back a couple of feet of shoots so that they could be strong enough to handle the wind in other words when it first starts growing it needs a little time to get strong enough to be able to handle what the world what the environment what nature is going to throw at it third thing they were removal of some flowers and grape clusters from the vine itself so that the better healthier parts of the vine could produce more so sometimes it was producing fruit but they would still cut that bud away so that the stuff that was growing beside it could grow better because it was in a better situation or those types of things. There's only a certain amount of nutrients and strength that the vine has to be able to grow these things, so they would cut it back so it would grow properly. That uh, is, is the spring pruning. I said there were four, and I only gave you three. That's how that goes sometimes. The, the other one was uh, the fall pruning. Okay? Uh, now this... Uh, were the ones that were left that would produce more and better and qua better quality fruit. So they would prune away. This is in, when they're dormant. This is when things have, have, have the harvest has already taken place, and now they're dormant. They're not growing. They're, they're brown. They look dead. They're not dead. They're just not growing. And so they would cut back ones uh, that, that, that grew fruit, but this way it would grow better 
quality fruit. And they would also remove the suckers, which is an interesting word to use. They would remove the suckers. Now, suckers, they grow below the ground or off the trunk. These were cut so that they didn't compromise the strength of the entire vine by sucking away nutrients that the, that the real fruit, that the real vine-producing branches needed to grow that. Okay? So you had a spring, clean, a spring pruning and a fall pruning. Now, this is what that looks like. Okay? This, is, this is what we're talking about. Now, this, this does matter. This is not me just being a nerd and being stupid and wasting your time. So this, on the left, that's what it would look like after the harvest. Okay? That was what it looked like after the harvest where nothing is growing. You would cut most of that away. Sometimes up to 90% of a grapevine is cut back in the fall. That's a lot of pruning that takes place because they grow like crazy. Now, on this side over here is what I want you to see because it really, I think, it helps illuminate things for those of us that are visual. This side is what it looks like when it's growing. You've got the trunk, okay? And then you've got a branch that grows out this way, usually called a cane. Now, the things that grow up off of that with the leaves that eventually have buds that grow grapes, those are called shoots. Keep that word in mind, a shoot, okay? That's the actual part that grows off the branch that actually produces the grape or the fruit. Now, this one here on the bottom, I don't know if you can see it, but that very bottom green-looking plant, that's the sucker, that's the one growing that, that's not going to help anything. It's just going to suck away nutrients and not help anything. So they cut that sucker away because it's growing in the wrong place. Okay? So, again, keep shoots in mind because that word will come back up again. So let's dig into what these verses have to say, and hopefully it speaks to us this morning. It says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vineyard keeper. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vineyard keeper. Why does Jesus say that he is the true vine. What, what is the reference here? What is he talking about? He uses that word several times in John, uh, alethos, which is true or genuine or real or authentic in reference to whom? Who would not be the, uh, the true vine? What is he talking about? Now, Matt, when I mess up Greek words, I want you to stand up and pronounce them properly for me because I never pronounce them correctly. Okay, Matt's here today and he can help me with that. The Lord provides. Um, so let's take a look at Isaiah 5, because there's, there's a continuing theme in Scripture of this. Isaiah chapter 5, you can read it along with me, especially if you're out there through the camera. It says, I will sing about the one I love, a song about my loved one's vineyard. The one I loved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He broke up the soil, cleared it of stones, and planted it with the finest vines. He built a tower in the middle of it, and even dug out a wine press there. He expected it to yield good grapes or good fruit, but it yielded worthless grapes. So now, residents of Jerusalem and men of Judah, please judge between me and my vineyard. What more could I have done for my vineyard than I did? Why, when I expected a yield of good grapes, did it produce, did it yield worthless grapes? Now I will tell you what I'm about to do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge, its protection, and it will be consumed. I will tear down its wall and it will be trampled. I will make it a wasteland. I will not, it will not be pruned or weeded. It will not be taken care of. Thorns and briars will grow up. I will also give orders to the clouds that rain, that rain should not fall on it. So this is Isaiah 5, the prophet, and he's talking about Israel. This is the prophet talking about Israel. This is what, how God refers to Israel as a vine press. Okay? Now, these next, this next verse is in that same chapter and is the most important of those to help explain it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts, love that name, is the house of Israel and the men of Judah, the plant he delighted in. He looked for justice, but he saw injustice. For righteousness, but heard cries of wretchedness. Israel is represented as a vineyard planted by the Lord from which he expects good grapes to grow, good fruit to grow, but which produced only bad grapes and therefore had to be destroyed. What does he look at that is the bad grapes of Israel? It says right there, he looked for justice but saw injustice. He looked for righteousness but heard cries of wretchedness. Or you could go to Psalm 80, and we could go all over Scripture, but these are just two decent examples of God calling Israel, or referencing Israel as the vine. You uprooted a vine from Egypt. This is Psalm 80, starting in verse 8. You uprooted a vine from Egypt. You drove out the nations and planted it. You cleared a place for it. It took root and filled the land. The mountains were covered by its shade and the mighty cedars with its branches. It sent out sprouts toward the sea and shoots 
toward the river. Why have you broken down its walls so that all who pass by pick its fruit? The, the boar from the forest tears it, and, and creatures of the field feed on it. Return, God of hosts. Look down from heaven and see. Take care of this vine, the root your right hand has planted, the shoot that you made strong for yourself. Verse 16 there in Psalm 80. It was cut down and burned up. They perish at the rebuke of your countenance. Let your hand be with the man at your right hand. With the son of man you have made strong for yourself. Israel is supposed to be a vineyard producing fruit of righteousness for the world. That is the opportunity given to it by God. He chose them and gave them the opportunity to show his righteousness to the world. But they did not fulfill that opportunity given to them. So Jesus comes back and says, I am the true vine, the one that will fulfill this, the one that will bring righteousness to the world. Now listen to Isaiah 11 with the same mindset and the same context that we're talking about and tell me who Isaiah 11 is describing. Then a shoot, see it keeps coming back up, will grow from the stump of Jesse and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him a spirit of wisdom and understanding, a spirit of counsel and strength, a spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. His delight will be in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what what he sees with his eyes. He will not execute justice by what he hears with his ears, but he will judge the poor righteously and execute justice for the oppressed of the land. That's Isaiah 11. That we now clearly look back on and say that's a messianic prophecy that was that was for their day but that is also talking about the one to come the one who was going to come and make all things right this is 600 years and some change before jesus was on the earth when this was written and prophesied by the prophet isaiah this terminology is deeply woven into the jewish mindset this vineyard Grapes, producing good fruit, producing bad fruit. This idea of a vineyard keeper, this idea of of righteousness being tied to good fruit and all those types of things. There's an expectation in the Jewish mind of a savior king, a messiah from the line of David. That's how it starts. Then a shoot will grow from the stump of Jesse. Jesse is David's father. The King David, his father was Jesse. For those of us that don't know that, now you do. So from the line of David, a king that sets all things right. A king, will, a king that's willing to suffer for the betterment of his people. And a king powerful enough to set all things right. Now what they didn't expect was that to happen with the same person at two different times. That's what confused them, one of many things that confused them about Jesus. Jesus came to suffer and die, and then Jesus will come back to conquer and set all things right. Because we know that we live in a present reality that actually isn't present reality yet. In eternity, it's already a reality that Jesus has conquered death, conquered Satan, conquered sin, conquered sorrow. He's conquered all of it, but he is coming back to make that a visible reality to all things created, a true vine that will produce true righteousness as God defines it. Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser or the farmer or the gardener, the person that's responsible for tending the vine and the fruit that that vine will produce. A lot's going on in that one little bitty statement. Moving on. Every branch of me that does not produce fruit, he removes, and he prunes every branch that produces fruit so that it will produce more fruit. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Again, this is Jesus talking to his disciples. Now remember the context we're in. This is not long before he's about to be re- arrested. This is not long before he's about to be crucified. This is, this is after the Last Supper. The Last Supper has already taken place. This is in between the Last Supper and the arrest of Jesus after Judas betrays him. Jud- Judas has already left to go betray him. That's where we're at. Like This is crunch time. This is crunch time in Jesus' life and in Scripture when he's talking here. So keep that in mind as we go through this because it, it helps understand the urgency. But he says, every branch of me that does not produce fruit, he removes. Now, most English translations say something like that, removes or takes it away, and that's not wrong. Uh, It's it's not wrong at all, but that word has multiple meanings, and most of the time that word in Greek means lifted up, to to be raised up. 
So, so, the, so you, the meaning of that could be someone who is in Christ, because it says every branch in me that does not produce fruit, he removes. It could be, think about how we talked about grapes growing, it could be the grapevine growing on the ground that is a grapevine, that is in Jesus, that is a Christ follower, but it's struggling in what life is throwing at it. And so the vine dresser comes and picks up that grapevine, lifts it up, places it on a pole, places, places it on a trellis so that it can produce fruit. It gets encouraged, it gets exhorted, it gets lifted up. Both translations are right because this point he's making right here, he makes again here in just a couple of verses. So it's not wrong to say this, but there is that possibility that this is actually talking, this part is actually talking about a Christian who just needs encouragement from, encouragement from Christ, from God the Father. And then it says, and he prunes every branch that produces fruit so that it will produce more fruit. Again, up to 90% of that grapevine sometimes is cut back when dormant. We have a lot of us, ourselves, our, who we are, that needs to be pruned away. I mean, think about that. If a grapevine needs 90% of it cut away when it's dormant and not growing, when it's in a season, when it's in a season of, of waiting, when it's in a season of struggle, when it's in a season of pain, when it's in a season that it's not producing, it's not the fun part, the fruit's not popping up everywhere and you're getting to celebrate like we were this morning, sometimes you're in a season of, of, of struggle. Most of the time I've found in those seasons, God takes me and he starts sniffing away parts of me that are, that are terrible, that are, that are ugly, that are not righteous, that are, that are exactly what he came to get rid of. Sometimes there's a lot in us, even as a follower of Jesus. As a, even as somebody that comes here dressed up, looking pretty every Sunday, sometimes there's just a lot of ugly in us that's got to be cut away and pruned away. And what cleanses us? What does that? That's right here. The Word of Christ. God's Word is what cleanses us. And that's why I keep coming back to the challenge that I gave us as a church at the beginning of the year. Four days or more a week in the Word. I'm not asking you to read the entire book in a month or in a year. You can read the same couple of verses every day and just think about those and what they mean, how they apply to your life. At least four days a week. God's Word has power when we put it into our hearts. Verse 4, remain in me and I in you, just as a branch is unable to produce fruit by itself unless it remains on the vine, so neither can you unless you remain in me. Now, this doesn't, say doesn't, I woke for a few of you up. This doesn't mean that if you'll hold on tight to Jesus in your power and in your strength, then you'll remain in Jesus. That's not what this means. You cannot do that. I cannot do that. We do not have that power. We do not have that power. That's not what it means. It means to stay in fellowship with Jesus, which is a choice. To stay in fellowship with Jesus. Because without him, we are powerless to produce fruit. This is talking about fellowship. And, 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 our, and our, our fellowship in any relationship can be damaged by how we behave. Let that linger. Our fellowship together in any relationship, can be damaged by how we behave. It can also be strengthened and encouraged and grown stronger by how we behave, how we obey, whether or not we obey. I mean, it is Father's Day. You want to know what makes your dad the happiest when you do what he's asked you to do, period. When he says, this is the right thing to do. And you do that. It's like, yes. You know what hurts? <laughs> the opposite of that. That's not any fun. Verse 5, Jesus has, has tended to do throughout this entire seven statements of I am, doubles down and makes sure they're getting it. I am the vine. You are the branches, my followers. You are the branches. I'm what's holding it all together, but you're growing off of me, the one who remains in me and I in him produces much fruit because you can do nothing without me. Remaining in fellowship with Jesus is key to fruit production. Now the title of today, and I don't always throw a title out there, but I always try to have a title in mind. The title today is Talk is Cheap, Fruit is Real. 
talk is cheap, fruit is real. Now, why would I say that? Remember the context where we are here. Who's just left? Who's not with them anymore? It was 12, now it's 11. Who's gone? Judas, a guy who's been there as a follower of Jesus now for years. Years. You say, I don't understand. How could they do that? They got baptized one time. How come they walked away from the church? I saw them walk the aisle. They said some stuff. I'm, I, and, I, and I always hate when, when we have to make this point because I don't want to downplay the importance of making a profession of faith. And I certainly don't want to downplay baptism. But all I'm saying is, Jesus is clear. If you are of him, you will produce fruit. You can say what you want. You can get wet as many times as you want. But unless you are in him, unless you have submitted to him, unless you are in continuing fellowship with him, then you're proving yourself to not be one of his followers, just like Judas did. I mean, he was with the 12 all the time. When he walked off and went to those dudes to get some silver, anybody that had been around could have been like, that's one of those Jesus followers. That's one of those Jesus followers. Have you ever heard somebody say, you know, I don't go to church anymore because, fill in the blank for that because, right? I don't go to church anymore because, bunch of hypocrites. I don't go to church anymore because X, Y, Z. I don't go to church anymore because so-and-so down there hurt my feelings. I don't go to church anymore because this, this, and that. Okay? Here's what that's like. And I didn't make this up. Frank Turek said this. He's a lot smarter than I am. But I'm smart enough to copy him. Saying that is like saying you go what, you know, to an airport and there's a, there's a grand piano there. And somebody sits down to play Beethoven. And they just butcher it. I mean butcher it. Which is what it would sound like if I tried to play it. So picture me sitting there, and I'm just butchering Beethoven, because that's what would happen. Now, if I were walking by, and I knew what that was supposed to sound like, I wouldn't go, man, Beethoven is terrible. He's awful. What was he thinking? No, I would blame the person that is supposed to be playing Beethoven, right? That's what it's like when you blame stuff that happens between human beings on Jesus. Now, we're supposed to represent him well. It is a great responsibility, but you don't stop following Jesus because Jesus' followers aren't doing it right. Sometimes real Jesus' followers aren't doing it right. What happens? We've got to get pruned. And sometimes, over a lifetime, someone who says that they're a Jesus' follower just flat out proves that they're not, no matter what they've said, because there is no evidence of fruit in their lives. Now, is that for me to make up my mind on who that is? Absolutely not. I don't get that right. You don't get that right. We don't have enough information to make that decision. There's only one who gets to make that decision. The one who paid it all to be able to give us that chance in the first place. Jesus Christ gets to make that decision. I don't. It's not for us to determine. I'm just, I'm throwing that out there because just saying you're following Jesus is not following Jesus. Following Jesus is following Jesus. Does that make sense? Yeah. Moving along. Verse 6. I can tell we're loving this today. It's one of those days where we're just getting so much feedback. It's great. I you just want to preach for another hour. If anyone does not remain in me, he is thrown aside like a branch and he withers. They gather them, throw them into the fire, and they are burned. Remember the context. He's talking about Judas right here. For sure. What happens to those of us who don't follow Jesus? We're judged because Christ has the right to judge. You and I do not, but he does. And he says that is what's going to happen. Again, talk is cheap. Fruit is real. You know, I can just hear Judas, I can hear Judas with his excuses. Well, but that's not what I thought the Messiah was going to be. I thought he was going to like to Rome or something. I didn't think he was going to lay down his life. How lame is that I thought he was going to like fight or something I thought he was going to like kick a few people out of the, you know like I thought he was going to do something now he's going to die that's what we do Jesus isn't what I expected my life to look like Je- Jesus I don't understand why I'm having to whatever that fills in that blank and, and then we just walk away because you were following Jesus Simply and only for what Christ could give you in this life. And you're completely missing the point. If that's your heart. You're completely missing the point. 
if that's your heart. <laughs> it's who he is for eternity. Not for the next five minutes. Not for the vapor of the life that we're in right now. Verse 7. We're almost done. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you want, and it will be done for you. There's a verse everybody loves. My Father is glorified by this, that you produce much fruit and prove to be my disciples. If, you're, if my words remain in you, if my words remain in you, if my word remains in you, if you hear, O Israel, the word of the Lord, if you, what does that mean? It means to listen and obey. When, when the word of God says you hear his word, it means to listen and obey. It means one thing. It means action. Remaining in his word, remaining in him, means action. It means doing things that make things heavenly on earth. That's what we have been called to do. God is glorified when the people who say they follow Jesus have the fruit of righteousness in their life. People that say they follow Jesus have the fruit of righteousness, fruit of righteousness produced in their life. That can only come from the Father. Verse 9. As the Father has loved me, I also loved you. Remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. How do you remain in Christ's love? How do you remain in fellowship with him? The same way you do with any other authority figure in your life. You do what you're supposed to do. And when you don't, you don't make excuses. You repent. Just like if your boss came to you and said, Hey, you painted that wall purple. I asked you to paint it blue. If you say, well, I thought that was blue. It looks like blue to me. He's like, no, it's purple. And you're like, well, I think it's blue. Well, then your relationship with your boss is now damaged. But if you say, oh, you're right. I'm wrong. I'll go back and I'll repaint it the right color. Doing the right thing strengthens your relationship. Doing the wrong thing hurts your relationship. Doing the wrong thing and not repenting from that kills your relationship and proves you to not be part of that relationship in the first place. Oh, it's a lot. Verse 11. I have spoken these things to you so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. This is my command. What am I supposed to do, Jesus? This is my command. Love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this that someone would lay down his life for his friends. This is my command. Love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, that someone would lay down his life for his friends. He, he says that I have spoken these things so that you may have my joy, the joy of God, and your joy may be complete. And then he says, this is how you know how far I'm willing to go. This is how much you know how much I love you. I'm willing to lay down my life for you. See, Judas, Judas missed it. He thought it was lame. He thought it was weak. He didn't understand that it was the most powerful and strong thing that anyone could possibly do for mankind to take on the sins of everyone and the wrath of the Father to be punished in our place. There was nothing more he could have done than to prove that he loves us than to do what he did. There was absolutely nothing more. So when I prayed earlier that I hope someone comes to the day of salvation today you come to the point where you say i'm a sinner i want to turn from that and turn to christ i understand jesus shed his blood for me he showed his love for me he displayed that he cares for me by what he did on the cross i want to place my faith in that my hope and my trust and begin a journey of following him from now until he comes home or calls me home either one if that's your heart we would love for you to express that today as we finish in song here in just a minute we would, we would celebrate that with you, that profession of faith. We would encourage you to get baptized because that's an obedient thing to do, speaking of remaining in fellowship and doing what you're supposed to do. But maybe you're here this morning and you're like, done that, what else? And we'll finish with this, and this is the last slide. You want to come, go ahead and come up, Josh, we'll be ready. He says that he came and spoke these things so that my joy may be in you. Jesus wanted us to have his joy and to have it completely. So, so stop trying to produce fruit in your life. That's not how it works. Just focus on who Jesus is and what he's done for you. Focus on his word 
as much and as often as you can. Abide in the Lord. Dwell in the Lord. Remain in the Lord. Let His Word richly dwell in your heart. Let your words of your mouth and the meditation of your heart be acceptable in His sight. O Lord, my rock and redeemer, which is from the Psalms. I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. When we fix our eyes on Christ, when we, when we fix our eyes on who Jesus is, who God is, the fruit takes care of itself. We remain in the vine. Say, so what, is, what is the fruit? I think there's two types of fruit. There's the fruit of the Spirit, which is the fruit of righteousness. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. I think, I think when, we, when we remain in Christ, when we dwell in Him richly, I think those things just become part of who we are. I think that's how it works. I think Jesus, like a, like a, like a shoot growing out of a vine that just has the stuff it needs for grapes to be produced, I think it just happens. I don't think it happens because I go, this year I'm going to be patient. And then 15 minutes later I'll lose my patience. I don't think that's how it works. We remain in Him and His, His fruit grows out of us the fruit that comes from abiding. But I think it also is this. I think when we do that, when we remain in Him, when His fruit of the Spirit is being produced in our lives, which is how He remains in us, by the way, He gave us the Counselor, He gave us the Holy Spirit when He was sending back to the Father. Because we show the love of Christ to the world, that is a witness to a lost and dying world and gives us the opportunity to witness about Him. I think that's also the, produce, the fruit that's being talked about being produced, being produced. Witnessing someone come to faith in Christ. There's no greater miracle that we can witness. What am I saying? I'm saying fruit begets fruit begets fruit begets fruit. You know you can cut off a healthy shoot. You can cut off a healthy shoot that produces grape, grapes and you can take it and you can plant it. You can fertilize it and you can weed it and you can take care of it and it takes a little time. But eventually that will grow into a grapevine and produce more fruit. And I think that's what we're supposed to do. I think when we live for Jesus, other people come to faith in Jesus. I think when our church lives for Jesus, then I think God will send us people that he wants to be saved. I think they'll just, I think they'll come. They'll come by how you're out there loving on them, loving the world. That's what I think. I could be wrong, but I don't think I am. <laughs> Not on this one. Not this time. Father, I pray that I pray that we would have hearts that desires to see fruit produced in our life, God. I pray that we just quit pretending, quit faking it. And that we just depend on you. So that we would actually see revival in our hearts and in our community. For those, for those of us that are, that are not there, that are far from you, God, I pray that you would convict our hearts today with your Holy Spirit in such a way that we cannot rest until we repent and get right with you so that you can use us how you see fit. Lord, I pray if there's anyone that needs to make a decision during this time that your will would be done, that we would be obedient to the move of the Spirit, that someone would come to faith in you today, whatever it may be, God. In Jesus' name I pray it. Amen. I invite you to stand for this last song.
troubles of my day and because you are my stronghold my faithful God I sing your praise oh Lord you are the stronghold for this life I live finish with the Great Commission, because speaking of producing fruit, that's what we're supposed to do. Um, and I'm going to uh, pray for us for the meal real quick, and then uh, if, we'll, if we'll let our senior adults go first to the meal. If you're new here with us, if you're a guest here with us today, we have food for you. We have enough. We have plenty. Uh, through this door, we'll go back there and we'll eat. We also do have a little bit of business to handle at the uh, towards the end of the meal, so looking forward to that. So I'm going to pray for us, and then we'll do the Great Commission, and then we'll head out. Father, thank you for this meal that you have given us. Thank you for the hands that have so diligently worked so hard and put in so much time to make today possible. God, I pray that you would bless them and bless their efforts or bless their soul uh, and, and, and knowing that service for you, God, is never, is never in vain. And we thank you for them and we thank you for every, every father that is here, God, and we just pray that you would strengthen them to be the leader uh, of their home and of their family that you've called them to be, God. And we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Then Jesus came near and said to them, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Amen. Let's go eat. <laughs> 